Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks so much for stopping by to YouTube. Today, we are going to have an excellent discussion on the mechanics of strongman, specifically the Atlas Stone Lift. I want to dive deep into technique with the 2019 World's Strongest Man and also explore anatomy and biomechanics from a performance and safety viewpoint with the world's foremost authority on back mechanics, Dr. Stuart McGill. So, Martins, I know many people listening and watching this have seen the World's Strongest Man competitions on TV, but many have not lifted stones themselves. So as a beginner's guy, can you walk me through the Atlas Stone Lift technique? So number one, I like to kind of uh, place myself over the stone. It's very important that the diameter of the stone is slightly behind the ball of my feet. Because if the stone's in front of my feet like so, I'm not going to be able to lift it because the center mass is not centered beneath me. So, and I also like to try to keep my, um, my tibia nice and tight against the stone with my feet, just angled outwards just enough so that my hands can slide between my knees and also between my hands, I mean, between my feet and the stone. I try to uh, grab the stone with wide spread fingers with the diameter of the stone bisecting my hand like this. So that way, Let's say if you place a hand behind the diameter, it's going to roll forward. If you place the hand in front of the, the center of the stone, it's going to roll back into me. So right in the middle is very important. And I'll try to keep my arms as straight as possible. There's going to be a little bit of an elbow bend, but it's just very important to keep your hands or your wrists stacked below your elbows, stacked below your shoulders. So I squat really deep, as you can see. I lift it up, then I put my feet together. So right away, so right when I get to this part, my feet come in, and this is the most important part. I don't try to lift the uh, stiff back because that's what's going to put pressure on my lower back. I reel the stone close to my hips, see around my back around the stone, have my hands in a 10 to 2 o'clock position, so that way I can push my hips into it, and it rolls up like so. My hands are just guiding the roll. My arms are not really lifting the stone. It's all that, that my hips have contact against the stone. My hips are driving into the stone. And then rolling it up like so. After that, I put it on a platform or push it over a bar. Now, Stu, you're one of the few people who have ever researched muscle activation patterns and loads on the body during these different strongman events. Can you tell me a little bit about the research and if you've noticed any significant difference between elite and non-elite stone lifters during that event? Yes. Uh, if we go back to our paper we published in Strength and Conditioning Journal in 2008, I believe it was, I published graphs of uh, muscle activation profiles, spine curvature, and those sorts of things of some junior uh, levels, plus uh, a very mature strength pro uh, strongman. So as you can see in the uh, graph here on the left-hand side is a junior stone lifter who activates their back muscles long before any other muscle. In other words, they're lifting the stone, which is the first part that uh, Martins just demonstrated is really a deadlift of the stone and they used their back. But you can see the spine is at its peak flexion as the person gets into this back lift as they're doing it. And then throughout the rest of the lift, their spine is unfolding out of full flexion. In other words, it's moving under load. And then later on, the abdominal wall kicks in, the uh, back muscles kick in, and all the time the spine is moving. But what Martins uh, cleverly showed was the spine and the stone becomes one. Well, that does several things. It turns the spine into stone as well, which is very important to unleash the hips. So as the hip power drives, and then when we see a pro lifter, the, all of the muscles begin their sequencing together. You're building the lifter's wedge, the stiffness, then the hips unleash. Notice that the spine has not moved yet. And then the hips, and as Martin showed, the cocking back of the hips and the hip thrust to give the stone momentum to roll it up, the spine still hasn't moved. And then at the very end, the chest and the thoracic spine 
is what we call the hoik, hoiks the stone up onto the platform. And then at the very end, the lumbar spine has now come out of the flexion angle. So it's locked in other words, which uh, does special things for injury resilience, but it also allows full uh, power uh, um, development and delivery up through the uh, torso when the spine is locked and stiffened. That's awesome. And I, I love to see the research on that so we can really get an understanding what's going on. And, and Martins, I want to know from your perspective and how you've noticed power can change. Tell me about why it's so important to optimize your spinal position during the lift. I know you've talked about the cues before to get rid of the gaps between you and the stone or you and the stone become one. Why is that so important in a power production and a performance standpoint during this lift? Um, so when you get rid of that gap between the stone and the hips, that force drive from the hips into the stone is immediate. And the back isn't lifting the stone whatsoever. If there is a space, however, that load goes right to the back. Mm. Yeah, that makes total sense. And if and, you want, I could also demonstrate that it's actually kind of cool. Yeah, let's, let's show that real quick. That'd be yeah. great. Because another thing that could happen is if you have that gap, the stone can slip. Mm. And uh, you'll see this in a lot of newer lifters that try to lift with a neutral spine. The, the stone ends up slipping downwards. Okay, so I'll show you one variation with the, with the gap. Okay, so now I have this gap, right? There's about half a foot of space between me and the stone, like I could put my arm through here. What happens oftentimes when the stone is heavy, it just slips down, you see? Mm, yeah. It just kind of slips into that gap and then it's tight against the hips and then it moves and then you, this is the maximum height you get of the stone. So that's why it's important to get that, get rid of that gap, really round yourself around the stone and then the stone ends up higher versus the gap ends up about here, get rid of the gap, get that roll much higher. If you have the strength, however, to row the stone in, despite the gap, some guys can do this, then it's back, 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 and then you finally get the lift. But I immediately start feeling that in my rectors. There you go. That makes sense. So from both a, a safety and a performance standpoint, it makes sense that you want that gradual flexion around the stone to limit any gapping. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. So this is why I'm so excited to uh, bring you into this part of the conversation, Stu, is because many people misinterpret your work and they say, McGill doesn't like any spinal flexion, but clearly you have to be in a very flexed position during this lift. There's no way to lift an Atlas stone with a neutral spine. So to start, can you explain the mechanics of what's happening during the Atlas stone lift? There's two parts to your introduction to this that are very important, Aaron. So if I may, can I first address what you called the misinterpretation, and then we'll get into the context of the stone lift? Definitely. So it's, it's going to be a little bit of a, a longer answer, but this is very important. Um, so in terms of this misinterpretation that McGill hates spine flexion, well, I, I don't know if they are aware of our work with jujitsu players, Olympic rowers, uh, gymnasts, etc. all that eventually uh, have to uh, adopt a, a spine flexion ability. So uh, anyway, let's see how we can go along with this. It's the context of the discussion that is uh, paramount. Usually when people ask me to explain the disc bulging mechanism, I show it is a flexion uh, coupled with load repeated over and over again that delaminates the collagen. And then we uh, perform tests, provocation tests on the person to show that yes, it's flexion that is triggering their pain. Um, if they are a lifter, by the way, other people who aren't lifters, who are mobility kinds of athletes, sometimes extension can, can trigger a, a, a disc bulge mimicking mechanism as well. But that, that's another uh, issue. So we developed spine hygiene and the avoidance of flexion for that 
reflection triggered person while they are uh, in this situation. But the whole context changes when we talk about building a foundation for athleticism in strong men and jujitsu players and, and all the rest of it. Here we have to develop a capacity to train and compete, but we deal with flexion in a very athlete specific way. So how we would train a strong man versus a jujitsu athlete um, really matters. Um, so to say when uh, McGill always avoids flexion, um, I don't know what people are thinking if, if they don't get the context or they're an internet warrior who's never done work themselves and investigated the various mechanisms and how, all sorts of variables like prior injury history, the spine thickness determines, as we're, we're going to see in a few minutes, mm -hmm. whether uh, that person will succumb to repeated flexion with less cycles of load. It, it, it's a bit complicated, but uh, there's always a context to all of this. So can I then go to a little bit of a model? I might show two or three models now to explain how all these variables come together uh, in, in certain contexts. So a uh, spinal joint, a disc, is not a ball and socket joint. Its basic architecture is the middle of the disc is a gel. It's an incompressible hydraulic fluid, actually. The layers that form the outside of the disc are actually strands of collagen that are held together with a gooey ground substance. Those collagen fibers form a fabric. So now let me go to an example of a fabric and you can see the weave of the fibers in this fabric. I am going to delaminate those fibers now with repeated stress strain reversals of movement back and forth flexion extension, in other words, in, in a spine. So I'm just going to simply do that. And you can see very quickly how the fibers start to delaminate with stress strain reversals. So now in a disc, if you add load. So we could have someone on all fours doing cat camel motion back and forth. We've never measured any delamination stresses. But if you add load to this, the game changes. You compress the nucleus in the middle and the collagen fibers slowly work apart and then the pressurized nucleus can work its way through the delaminations, which I'm just gonna show here now. There is a delamination through the collagen fibers and you can start to see how I can pressurize and get the nucleus right there to come through the delaminated collagen. So I had to set that up with movement with load first. So there's um, uh, a little bit of a start on the mechanism. And to summarize that, we need motion plus load, like doing a repeated sit up, for example, would set up a uh, a situation where when the person then lifted with full flexion and moved the spine at the same time, uh, it would create the hydraulic stresses to push the hydraulic fluid, the gel, through the collagen. So here on this model, and these are all made by Dynamic Disc Designs. Uh, they're a fabulous group that have uh, uh, captured a lot of these mechanisms that we were able to document over the years in the laboratory. Can you see the red mark on the back of that annulus there? Now I'm going to squeeze the spine and allow it to flex forward. And you can see the, the, the collagen fibers delaminating, where, or sorry, they've already delaminated, but now I'm driving the nuclear gel, creating a disc bulge, which will press uh, on a nerve root uh, in many people. But now I'm going to prevent it. I'm going to stack the spine tall, not allow flexion, and I squeeze, and you can see the whole disc deforming under compressive load, but 
it's not flexing forward, driving the hydraulic effort posteriorly. So when a person has that kind of injury, the avoidance of flexion is paramount and they won't be the atlas or the uh, uh, stone lifters uh, uh, for this uh, discussion. So to summarize, we now see it's flexion motion that causes the delamination to occur plus the load, but now let me ask the question, how do strong men like Martins develop this phenomenal ability to pick a stone off the floor and still be injury resilient? One thing that strong men do is they have a very, very mature strength. They are not small people. So now I, I just prepared this earlier today and I, I hope it works. Pretend these, this is the pathway of the erector spinae muscle. So in modest people like you and I, Aaron, there is the line of erector spinae behind the spine and it has a moment arm of about four centimeters. So those are the muscles that extend the spine. In some someone like Martins, that wrench handle of the muscle is double that. It's eight centimeters. So when a, 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 an athlete has developed that large, mature strength, you've doubled the wrench handle of the muscle. The load on the joint is now half because you've doubled the moment arm. So big muscles unload joints. It's a fabulous place to be. So there's yet uh, another reason why uh, uh, stone lifting is, is not for the neophyte uh, athlete or uh, strength athlete. It's a, it's a very special mature uh, kind of event. But uh, I did mention sit-ups as an example. And uh, again, the, the internet crowd will say, oh, McGill, you avoid flexion. There's some guy in Brazil who just did 10,000 sit-ups on, on YouTube. And I, and I think, well, yes, I don't even need to go and see that athlete because they will be very slender. You can take a slender willow branch and bend it back and forth, and it doesn't create the stresses. But when you take a, an athlete like Martins to bend a very thick structure, the bending stresses and the delamination stresses that I'm showing uh, develop very, very quickly with, with less bend and fewer repetitions. So Martins, uh, do you know of another strong man or yourself that trains their core with sit-ups, for example? I, I, absolutely nobody. So th th there's my point, absolutely nobody, because they would be setting themselves up and they would, for the delamination type of injury that I'm talking about, and uh, th they would not be resilient for stone lifting, deadlifting, uh, uh, et cetera. They, they need uh, strength, strongman athlete needs that inherent strength and uh, uh, stiffness. So um that's where i'll finish up uh the flexion misinterpretation as you called it aaron but now mm -hmm. can i move on to the strongman lift uh, sorry the stone lift yeah um philosophically as a sport strongman was designed to find the athlete's weakness it, it's not there to uh, save their bodies or, or anything like that so the stone lift as as martins demonstrated it really starts as a deficit uh deadlift and he he talked about the mechanics of the expertise and placing the hands and all the rest of it. But I'm going to explain it in terms of external mechanics and internal mechanics. So when Martins had the stone just behind the ball of his foot in the center of his hand, that creates a, a thrust line with gravity. The idea is to keep that thrust line in the middle of the foot and the further any joint above moves from the thrust line, that's the joint that takes the load in external mechanics. So as Martin deadlifts and then sits back, hugs the stone in and moves his hips back, he's pulling the, the, the ball right into the sweet spot of the thrust line minimum external mechanic. It's beautiful. And then as he does a hip thrust, giving the stone momentum, he brings the ball into a position 
over his hips, right into the thrust line once again. And now the hoik is much less external load on his spine. So it was a perfect expression of optimizing the external mechanics. Well, that's the uh, external mechanics from the internal mechanics. Uh, once again, he used his hips, 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 the, spa, the, the, the stone and spine became one, a very stable structure. He called it decreasing the space. I cr call it a very clever manipulation <laughs> of, of, the, of the internal mechanics. There was no chance for any micro movements uh, or delaminating stresses to occur. And then when the external mechanic was perfect, the ball was up over his hips, he could then place it on, on the platform. So it was a, a beautiful, uh, 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 expression of all of that. And uh, if I may, I've also got a tensegrity model, which uh, may add a little bit of insight or complexity. It depends on how much uh, knowledge you want of this. But uh, it, consider each one of these elements of vertebra in the spine attached with symmetric elastic members. But now I'm going to squeeze the spine and you're going to see that the, the joints buckle uh, at the same location in the same mode every time. Now, I've been, I think, the only scientist in the world to actually observe these in uh, deadlifting, um, athletes and uh, whiplash victims as well, who get a little bit, bit of disruption in the spine elastically. And we see buckle points. But what Martins showed was as he created uh, a unified stone with his spine uh, and the, uh, the stone, he stiffened out all potential for micro movements. And as we've discussed before, when the brain perceives a micro movement at a joint, it shuts down the strength. There is a neurological fuse box, the kiss of death for a strong man is for the brain to perceive a little bit of instability in a knee or in the spine. Wow. It will shut down the strength. I feel like I was going through that uh, with my deadlifts yesterday. And it's not spine related, it's a hip thing that I've been dealing with. Definitely. So Sue, you would say this is why there's a big difference between a Atlas stone where someone is flexed but stiffened around a stone versus a power lifter who's maybe performing a deadlift but allowing their back to continue to move. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of two perspectives when you ask that question. The first is a performance perspective in that you have to create a stiffened stone, if you will, of the torso, mm -hmm. uh, enabled by the stone to allow the hips to generate the power, lift the stiff jib crane. But could you imagine if the jib crane was flexible and the lifter failed to form a decent stiffened lifter's wedge, the hip power is just pushing rope. And uh, again, no, no one is strong pushing rope. You must push a rigid uh, stone. Um, but the deadlift, um, typically in strongman, uh, a good strongman will be lifting about half of what they could lift in a, uh, a deadlift. So it's a little bit less weight, but again, it's the same uh, stiffness that is required. But now, again, the whole context changes when we go to a injury risk perspective. And again, I've seen some of the internet chatter, oh, so-and-so deadlifter appears to have a flex spine. Well, A, they haven't measured it, and, and uh, I have, and it may be uh, flex to uh, some degree, but it's a totally different discussion for a lifter to fail to prepare the lifter's wedge in appropriate stiffness and allow their spine to bend. They rob their hips of generating full hip power, and they put stresses into a unstiffened spine. I mean, it, it's almost a lazy strategy to go to full flexion and say, oh, by default, that is now my stiffening, um, a stable, stabilizing default. You take it, any joint to the end range of motion and it becomes stable. That's what jujitsu players do to get a, an opponent to submit. You push a joint to the end range, it's stable, but it's now heavily uh, loaded versus a uh, outstanding deadlifter 
who stiffens creates a wonderful lifter's wedge, but then the crushing load of a thousand pounds forces their spine into flexion. That's a totally different mechanic. So to say and observe, oh, so-and-so lifted with a flex spine, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's a very junior understanding of the whole complexity of the strength athlete's performance and resilience. So Martins, going off of what Dr. McGill just talked about, um, I'd love from your perspective to talk about how, obviously with the flex posture of a stone lift, it's clearly much lighter than what you're capable of deadlifting. What's yes. some of the heaviest stones that you've done versus your ability to deadlift heavy? I mean, considering that uh, I've had a 970 pound deadlift, uh, the heaviest stone in the series is around half that. Mm. And, that's, and it, that's a big difference. And usually to prepare myself also for the strains of a stone lift, I'll do like paused Romanian deadlifts with weight that's 100 pounds or more over the stone. So to actually lift that stone usually off the ground usually is a joke from my back. Yeah, it's well within your capacity for what your back's capable of compared to the loads that are placed on it with the heavy deadlift. Very much so. And, and usually when I have a new lifter, I, I won't allow them to lift a certain wave of stone until they could show me they could um, do a paused Romanian deadlift beltless for many reps with that stone weight. And also to be able to front squat that same stone weight with a pause in the bottom of the hole beltless. When they could show that they could do these two mo mo motions um, uh, with ease, then I move them onto the stone and they can complete the stone lift very well. I think there's a lot of wisdom in, in that, talking about how you have specific prerequisites to being able to get to the stone. And that's first being able to show just a good RDL a good front squat. And the key that I, that I brought out of that is both beltless with pauses. And right. I think that's something that too many athletes rush to using a belt and they rush their tempo and they don't understand how pauses can be some of the most excellent ways, variations of lifts to be able to expose issues in capacity, to expose issues in technique. So by getting that down first, it then allows you to then show better competency when you do go to a, a lift like a stone. I really do love that. And I, I learned something from um, an old uh, strength coach I had, who's uh, Tom DeLong, um, that it's, when, when approaching any new strength or, or event or movement, you must learn the motion, then control the motion, and then explode the motion. But these first two phases, you want to spend plenty of time in before you get to the explosive phase. I love that. Now, let's say you have a young athlete that's been able to do a sufficient RDL beltless with pauses. They've been able to show front squat pauses beltless with good capacity for their technique. T take me through sort of the beginning learning stages of getting to a stone for the first time. What are some of the, the things that you're teaching that athlete as far as a technique and, and how quickly are they progressing in weight? So weight is all the way in the back of the mind number one is just lifting a light stone learning how to do it in all sorts of different um varieties to be able to uh, even the shoulder the stone to be able to do it for many repetitions but before all that just getting the stone pick position yourself over the stone showing me that you could budget just a few inches out of the floor maybe even doing repetitions of just the stone pick for the first week and then the next week we could start, or, or even depend, depending on where their strength's at, but down the line, progress to just uh, lapping the stone, getting into lap. And once you could lap it, then just start working those extensions of the hip. Now, what I want to do is, is take our, our discussion to a different strongman event, the yoke carry. And Stu, one thing that you mentioned to me earlier when we were talking about the different strongman events is that it's designed, strongman is designed to engineer out and to find your weakness. Can you explain a little bit more about what that means and how an athlete could be excellent in one event, but then fail to be that level of excellent in another? Yes. Okay. Well, that triggers my mind into two different uh, discussions. Uh, one is uh, one of internal external mechanics of say something like a yoke carry uh, and also one of anatomy to show, again, the uh, yin and the yang 
or there's no free lunch in uh, in all of this in terms of capability and and resilience. So let's start with the mechanic of uh, uh, say a, a yoke carry or a suitcase carry or something like that. Um, maybe uh, would it be better? I'll just show off my skinny little frame here. I'm sorry about this, but. Um, Pretend I had a load, I'm just going to pick up a kettle and I'm going to uh, suitcase carry this uh, kettle. And then we'll talk about a, a yoke in just a moment. So I'm now going to have a stance leg with my left and a swing leg with my right. The load is coming down my spine, across my pelvis and down my leg, correct? So as soon as we start to compare a stone lift or a dead lift, both legs are anchored on the ground. It is a sagittal plane strength challenge. But as soon as I go on to one leg, the dynamic just changed. The load comes down through my spine with the yoke or the implement uh, carried in the hand. And then if I have uh, a stance leg on my right, do you see how the spine thrust line comes down and then it has to shear across the pelvis, causing the hip to go into a deduction and this hip drops, but that would be a disaster for a strong man because the spine would have to frontal plane bend in order to stay upright. So you see that kind of strength is a hip adduction, abduction kind of strength. Strong men will always find your weakness. So uh, the, the, the way around that is, and I again, I think I'm the only guy who's measured this. I remember one pro strong man I measured, he had hip abduction strength of 500 newton meters. Well, a good strong back can extend about 400 newton meters. So it shows the, um, the, the, the absolute beastliness of the strong man to have 500 newton meters of that strength, which you need to hold the pelvis up if I'm going to carry 600 pounds uh, in a yoke, for example. Well, when we measure the great strong men carrying a yoke, they need 750 newton meters of strength in hip abduction to hold the pelvis flat to support the spine to allow a step. But we measure wow. they only have 500. So there it is. The strong man only has 500 newton meters of strength in their hip, but the lift and the carry required 750 newton meters. Where did that missing strength come from to hold up the hip? It came from quadratus lumborum on the other side and the obliques. Now, you've all heard a stronger core makes you stronger for the rest of your linkage and throughout your body. For the first time, many people are now starting to appreciate the mechanism. The core radiates out strength and shores up weaknesses at more distal joints. So there's a little bit of an explanation of uh, why core strength is absolutely non-negotiable for a uh, strong man. So there's half of the discussion. But the other half of the discussion now comes into anatomy. Variations in anatomy. Here's the uh, femur with the ball of the hip going into the hip socket. Now to do an atlas stone lift, the athlete must flex that hip as deep as it possibly can to pick the stone. Um, the deeper the hip can travel, the more advantage it is uh, for the athlete. But here is the uh, grand trade-off. Uh, Martins. Would you be good enough, and you are well known as a fabulous stone lifter, could yeah. I ask you to go on to all fours, uh, uh, hands and knees, and rock your pelvis back so that your pelvis touches your 
uh, or your buttocks rock back to your heels. Now, this is an anatomical test. It's a, it's a provocation sure. test, but it's a wonderful test for uh, athletics. There you go. That's why, look at the depth. Martins can get his knee well on the way towards his armpit. So that's absolutely a great advantage um, to pick a stone up off the ground. So what we've just proven with that test is that you have what is known in the orthopedic world as a shallow roof, the front of oh, the wow. hip that, socket. That test alone shows that, and not, not necessarily muscular flexibility, but actual. No, it, it's the shape of your hip socket. But now here's the rub. Um, <laughs> Uh, the deeper the hip socket, the less able the person is to flex the hip and pick the stone from the ground. But the deeper hip socket is a great advantage for the carries that we were talking about. So now we have an upright standing strength where a shallow roofed hip socket is now a disadvantage. So usually those who have a very deep squatting uh, power production in the hip are a little bit more compromised when they have to walk because the hip stability is no longer provided by the socket. Incredible. The socket is, is much shallower. So uh, you uh, may know what I'm talking about when mm -hmm. we're talking about what you feel in your hips when you carry. Hugely, absolutely. Yoke carry is one of my more difficult events to be uh, competitive in. I usually win or place in the very top in stone lifting, but when it comes to yoke, I could double my efforts and I, it still is difficult to be above middle pack for me. And, and that's part of what I'm trying to describe with all of these issues, uh, Aaron, that you try and tackle with uh, Squat University. Uh, these things are complicated. And the, the, the message I hope people take from all of this is there is no single way. Hip flexion isn't good or bad. Uh, none of these things are universal. The expertise comes when you have a, an athlete who can do all of these things and explain so eloquently what they do. They know how to train it. You have perhaps someone who can measure these kinds of things and understand that what works for one particular anatomy or physiology uh, is actually counter for the opposite end of the athletic spectrum. And then someone like you who's so clever at uh, putting all of this into rehabilitation contexts and your coaching uh, spanning the spectrum from rehabbing, understanding the flaw and the linkage and how that travels through for that particular athlete with that particular anatomy, with that particular event. So, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm in absolute heaven doing these things with you because uh, it, it's one of the few forums where you can bring all of this together and, and sh uh, you know, just to quote Bruce Lee, uh, there is no way you have to find it with putting together this team. This is and, so exciting. Uh, too. Uh, sorry to interrupt because I get so many questions, but I feel like each question alone would be an entire podcast. Uh, I, I, I get 200 of those a day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and most of the answers always start with, it depends. And that's, you've got yeah. that right. So Stu, I, I had one last question because we did find the weak link, I guess we would say with, with Martins because of the anatomy and he's so good at the Atlas Dome being able to flex down there. Yet we know his weak link is in the, the very heavy yoke carry. For someone who's maybe in a similar situation like Martins, is there any suggestion you would have as far as things that they could maybe add into their training or think about incorporating that could help give them a little bit better advantage to what their anatomy has uh, not allowed them to do as well in? Well, absolutely there is. I don't think there's going to be a hell of a lot of anatomical change to his hip sockets mm -hmm. that uh, we will create at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, however, I would uh, really like to uh, do just a little bit more assessment and come up with a very progressive frontal plane 
core and hip strength uh, program to give the most chance for allowing that stance and leg swing with uh, uh, frontal plane uh, core uh, athleticism. Um, I don't know if that's going to be translated to his feet. A little bit more uh, assessment will, uh, will reveal that. But the, there, there's a start. Mm -hmm. The second part of it comes in to the a cerebral side of being a strong man. And I know Martins uh, uh, can, can speak at length at this, but I learned it years ago from Bill Kazmar. And Bill was so clever at figuring out strongman strategies, uh, knowing that he wasn't good in every event and where he was going to place his effort and where he was going to back off the accelerator pedal. So at the end of the day, he had the points to win. But uh, maybe Martins would have uh, a few thoughts on that one as well. So again, the great athletes are also the most cerebral in figuring out their game plan. Yeah, Martins, can you touch on that uh, briefly? Well, absolutely. Um, so in strongman, Typically, the athlete that is the most well-rounded tends to win. You don't need to win the events. You want to get a good average. Um, so sometimes you see these guys that are superstars at like one event, but then they'll be very poor at another event. Um, I never worry about these guys because what I like to do is not that I don't go in to win each event. I try to place top three because then the average tends to be much better than let's say someone won two events, but bombed another two, uh, two or three events. If I just maintain my top level, I'll beat that person. So usually when I have a deficiency, I put my F, uh, full fo uh, focus on getting that up to at least a decent level. I'm not caring about winning that event. I'm caring about at least getting it to a point where I could get some points and stay in the top. I love that. And I think there's one other thing that I remember you saying, and this was actually a clip from, gosh, a couple years ago, World's Strongest Man, and you were being interviewed, and it was in the squat lift. And it was your attention to technique in mobility and going through the motion with very specific technique emphasis. And the person was asking you about, you know, your ability to do such a good looking lift and not struggle with it. And you mentioned that a lot of uh, strongman athletes, they're just so brutally strong, but yet sometimes they can allow that strength to to veer them away from being as technically proficient in certain lifts. And you mentioned that when you're technically sound in whatever lift you're doing, it allows you to express greater performance over time because it'll, you're basically unleashing every last ounce of energy out of your body into what you're trying to do. Um, so not only are we going about it as far as picking and choosing how you're trying to place, but also being as technically proficient in every single lift to be able to squeeze every last ounce of, of performance out of you. Absolutely. And also just watching the competitors, and let's say you're the last person to go, not, not pushing your body to the fullest limit, but just doing a little bit better than the other guys and yeah. then leaving enough strength and effort for the next event. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think that's an excellent wrap up discussion for, uh, for what we had in, on the table today. So first off, I want to thank both of you guys for, for jumping on and joining in the discussion. It's always excellent, Stu, to be able to, to, to have a talk with you and to learn from you of all, about all the mechanics of the back. And then Martins, this is the first time on the podcast for all, all the collaborations we've done. We actually haven't sat down and had a podcast that's discussion. Right. So. I'm, I'm so excited to be on board. We'll do another one after the Rogue Invitational. We'll get it in place so we can talk about our entire story of working together uh, with your that. return back to competition. So um, again, thank you. Oh, Aaron, yes. if, if, yeah. if I may, I just wanted to thank you for all that you do in pulling this together and, and helping so many people. And Martins, I know I've mentioned this to you before, but you're always so entertaining you compete with intensity but you always have that little twinkle in your eye which the crowd loves so thank you so much for that. your <laughs> contribution to my entertainment oh Stuart, that means the world to me thank you all right guys well everyone thank you so much for listening to today's podcast and watching this clip that i'm putting on youtube um until next time guys happy squatting they say that Energy flows where attention goes, so I pay no mind. Why waste my time with all these negative cats scratching? So caught up in their egos, these people have.